Okay, today's sermon, uh, the title is The Promises of All Promises. I need you, uh, as an example, I'm going to use this piano today. And let's just say that this piano is the promise that God has made. Of course, the promise is it's going to make music. You must learn the keys or the chords, obviously. You must learn to read music or learn to play by ear. There is a process to this promise. I cannot just sit in front of the piano and make music without first taking lessons, without first learning the plan in which it takes to operate a piano to produce the music. Now, I can get behind the piano and I can make sound, but to make music, that's a different story. I can't take my shoes off and play with my toes. I've got to use my fingers. I've got to train them. I've got to get them in condition and everything like that. I can't even get my guitar, that promise, and make it sound like the piano, another promise. Every promise has a distinct purpose, and we must find out what that is. If you would, let's go to Romans, the eighth chapter, and we're going to read verse 28. Very familiar scripture. You should all have it highlighted in your Bible. If you don't, today would be a good day if you believe in highlighting your Bible. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Let's read this one more time. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. We don't take a promise without figuring out the steps of the plan and without tapping in to the power of that promise. And that's why we don't just read Romans 8th chapter, verse 28, as a standalone verse. If you have in the past, you're missing out on the promise that God has made. You've got to dig down. You just can't read Romans 8, 28, even though that is a great scripture. Let's grab this scripture. And a lot of us make this into a magic bullet, a lucky charm, a rabbit's foot, if you would. But it's so much more than that. To be clear, we are not enjoying the music yet. We have to figure out the process of the plan to make sure that we are tapping into the power. Now, a while ago, whenever I was explaining the piano and everything like that, there is a process. I can't just sit at the piano and start playing. All right. Even if I knew how to chord the piano, even if I knew how to read music, even if I knew how to play by ear, there's one thing we have to do. We have to make sure that the power is plugged in and we turn the power on. Yes. Because it doesn't matter how much knowledge you have, doesn't matter how talented you are, if it doesn't have power and you don't turn it on, it's not going to produce the promise or the music in this case that it needs to have. All right. So let's not just jump into only verse 28. Let's go and get some context before and some context after to figure out what God's plan is for this purpose. So let's go to Romans. We're going to back up a little, <clears throat> a little bit. We're going to go to Romans 8. Verse 26, and we're going to read all the way to 30. So I'm going to bring my Bible out because I like this interpretation. And because of the fiasco last week that I'm sure Matt had to deal with, I'm going to go straight out of the Bible on the interpretation that I want. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our distress. For we do not even know what we should pray for. No how should we pray. 
but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groaning that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts know that the Spirit is saying, for the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose for them. For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn with many brothers and many sisters. And having chosen them, he called them to come to him, and he gave them the right standing with himself, and he promised them his glory. Isn't that awesome? He promised him his glory. I was talking with a co-worker this week about the trip that we took to the beach a couple of weekends ago. And what I like to do whenever we go to the beach, I like to just set up the canopy. We usually go with my granddaughter, so immediately she wants to build sand castles. So I'm down in the I'm down in the sand, just making sand castles, and and we always gotta <laughs> we always gotta dig holes, and she's always gotta make me go up to the beach and grab a bucket of water, and fill in the holes. But what she has yet to comprehend is, as soon as you pour the water in the sand, it soaks it up. So it's not like a swimming pool where you can just fill it up with water and the water stands. It stands for about two or three minutes and then you look at it and it's completely gone. Okay? I love that. I love to get on the golf cart, ride around and just watch people. Stop if I see a friend, talk to them, things like that. I love to feel the sand between my toes. The heat of the sun. I love to just take a walk into the waves of the Gulf of Mexico. I just love it. It's calming, it's peaceful, I enjoy it. However, my co-worker does not see it the same way. They would rather just sit in the balcony of the beach cabin with a book, or talk with their friends or family, and they like to watch the waves and the sounds that the waves make. Isn't it amazing how two human beings can see the same thing two different ways. But the thing about it is, is which one's the good way? Well, we can say both, and we'll be partly correct. But we've got to find God's way. We've got to find, even though it's good for me in the perspective that I have for the beach, and it's good for the perspective that my coworker has. They're both good. But what's God's good? What's God's promise? Human beings are selfish, so we like to do what we do, when we like to do it, how we like to do it, and whatever we like to do. God does not care for that too often. Because most of the time we do it out of selfishness. And we know that selfishness is not of God. Okay? Mistake number one. Okay. So, let's find out what God's promises is or are. So, let's look at the danger of Romans 8, 28. Where God tells us, hey, no matter what you face in life, I got this. It's going to work out for the best. The problem with that promise is that whose ideal of good are we going to go by? Are we going to go by mine or my co-workers? But first, let's stop and get our bearings on this. For just a moment, let's look at Romans 8, not just a particular verse. Let's look at the whole chapter. It has been said that every moment 
in every movement of a revival that it has somehow been connected with the teaching in the book of Romans. It is the highest point of the highest place for understanding and connecting with how we are to relate to God. Romans chapter 8 is the single greatest chapter in the entire Bible. I truly believe this. And I'm not alone. There's a lot of great evangelists, theologians, and preachers that will also agree. If you don't believe me, Google it. The chapter opens with there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. And it ends with there is no separation from those who are in Christ. I mean, isn't that a perfect book? There is no condemnation. And there is no separation from Christ. Nothing can be separated from us and from the love of Christ. It's all about grace and what grace does. It's about how we can earn or how we cannot earn anything without God. Romans is, the, <clears throat> is what tells us that our standing before God in our own nature, and that is the sin that we all have. For we all, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It is the book of Romans which tells us we can be saved by grace through faith. This book, this chapter has everything that we need to sustain a relationship with God. It is the greatest promise I feel that's in the Bible. Someone said that the Holy Scripture was a ring. Then Romans should be the stone that sits in the middle of that ring. And chapter 8 should be the sparkling point of that jewel. So in other words, let's say I don't have my ring on, but let's just say I have a ring. And it's got a beautiful diamond. So the ring itself is the Bible. The stone is Romans 8. And the shine that it glows, or it shines from there, isn't that just amazing? I mean, it's so simple how we look at the Bible and certain scriptures and we just have our own sense of what it means. But you know what? God can just open the eyes, just like the beach. I mean, it, it's wonderful the way I feel about it, but the way you feel about it is just as wonderful. Same subject. Two different definitions, two different thoughts, two different ideals. But if we don't see what God is saying is good, then we can mess up, and we can mess up pretty heavily. When Paul experienced <clears throat> and wrestled with his thoughts on how much disappointment there was in his own ability to follow God, Paul tells us in Romans 7 verse 19, if you have that scripture, let's go ahead and put that one up. Uh, I'll give you time to pull it up if, if you can, Chris. If not, I'll just go ahead and go with it. It's a pretty short scripture. But you've got to remember, we just came out of Romans 7 to enter into Romans 8. And we know how great Romans 8 can be. But chapter 7 was a different story. Paul was struggling with his own relationship, his own belief. He just didn't think that he was equipped enough. He just didn't think he was good enough. He just wasn't where he thought he needed to be with God. But we couldn't leave it like that. We had to move on to chapter 18. I mean, uh, I'm sorry. We had to move to chapter 8. So let's go ahead. Romans 17, or Romans 7, verse 19. For I do not do good that, that I want to do, but I practice the evil that I do not want to do. 
So in other words, I want to do good. All right? I really do. I truly want to do good. But my nature seems to go towards doing things I shouldn't do. Now, you can fill in your own definition on that. Mine is not set in stone, but I think you get the picture. I want to do good. I just don't do it. Isn't that funny? I want to do bad, so I do bad. You don't believe me? Just ask any two-year-old kid, three-year-old kid. Mommy wants her or her to do good. But the baby says, I want to do bad, so I do bad. I love kids. Y'all know that. But sometimes... Let me get this on camera. You just want to... You just want to... Ah. Even with grandkids. So, my granddaughter got a new game. And it's... Y'all may have to help me out, but it, it, it's a pad, and it plays music, and it's got nine different uh, buttons. But, I mean, they're pretty big. And it plays music, and, and it shows you which ones to step on. And it's supposed to teach you how to dance or, or what have you. So we're out there in the front yard last night playing this. Mosquitoes are tearing me up. Livy don't care. All right? Livy just wants to play. All right? And she stinks at this game right now. It's a new game. She's not familiar with it. So me and her mother are trying to help her through this maze of how to play this game. So we just sit down, all right, and she's still standing up. So, you know, whenever it shows the shoe that she's supposed to step on, she steps on it. But she's kind of slow, all right? And if you're too slow, then you don't get the points and you don't move to the next level. Well, the competitiveness of me and her mother, we want to make it to the next level. So we're going to help her out. So <laughs> I've got the bottom third, all right, and Taylor has... Uh, the upper two-thirds, okay? And Libby's just got everything. So the music starts and everything like that, and it's only one button at a time, okay? So we do this and everything like that, and we get all the points. So we move to level two. Now, level two is a little bit more difficult, not impossible, just a little bit harder, okay? So now there's, there's two that shows at the same time, but you have the same amount of time to hit two as you did on level one with just one. So we're using our hands and everything like that. All right, so we move to the next level, which is three. All right, three again, you still have the same amount of time, but you gotta hit three or four items within that time period. So me and Taylor are just, you know, going like this, and then Libby is a little slow Okay, but she's helping us out too. But at times, we're a little slow moving our hands off of it. So guess what? She steps on our hands and it hurts. But it's so much fun. But isn't that like we are with God? We try to help God out. All right? And guess what? It can be a little painful. And the bad thing about it is, as a Christian, as a young man, raised in Catholic, then put into a Baptist church, then to Assembly of God, and then into a non-denominational, I just had a different view, uh, pretty, pretty consistent throughout each level of religion that I endeavored in. But 
there was always a little difference between each each one. Okay, the greatest difference between Catholic and Baptist, and then still the same amount of difference between Baptist and Assembly of God. All right, and not much difference between all of those and what we have here. Okay, because we do have Catholic, we have some Baptists. All right, I'm a Baptist by heart. Okay, if they believed in speaking in tongues and and, and the clapping the hands and, and all that, it would be great for me. Because I like the way Baptist handles their service. All right? This amount of time, you're out by 12, period. It's not 12.01, all right? It's not 11.55, it's 12 o'clock, you're out. You can always count on the Baptist all right, letting you out on time. You can't do that here. <laughs> Especially whenever dad was preaching. <laughs> there was no way you were going to beat the Baptist. Well, first of all, there was no way you were going to beat the Catholic, and there was no way you were going to beat the Baptist to the restaurant. Plain and simple. And Silsby is not famous for many restaurants. We're not like Beaumont, okay? We have certain restaurants and everything like that. But you know, what I've always found out, or what I always knew about God is He loved me. No question about that. Sometimes I didn't understand how He loved me, or why He loved me, or why would He even invest the time and energy to send all of these people in my life to change it. That was my thought. But it wasn't to change me. All right? it, it just was not to change me. We look at our, our purpose for God is we need to change the world. We need to change the way they look at God. We need to just change. Quit trying to change anything. Just do what God tells you to do. Live by His promises. Live in His Word. And He will make all the necessary rearrangements. Okay? Because I don't care what you say. Whenever I go to order my wife's anniversary, birthday, special occasion flowers, I go now to a website. And those pictures of that flower arrangement is so beautiful, okay? And then whenever Angel sends me the picture of that beautiful arrangement, it looks absolutely nothing like what was presented. All right? But that's the way we are with God. Sister Deborah will present God in her way. Sister Jeanette will present God in her way. Neither way is wrong. All right? But it's often said, you know, there's three sides to a story. There's your way, their way, and then there's the truth. All right? And that's the way it is. All right? You've got your interpretation, you have your interpretation, and then you have the truth. And that's where God is. All right? Now, that doesn't mean to desert the way you look at a scripture or anything like that. It's just, okay, now this is the way I feel about this scripture. Okay, God, what do you say about it? Guide me through the scriptures to help me find your way, your good in this, your purpose in this scripture that you gave me. It's pretty simple. All right. You don't have to go to the pastor. You don't have to go to the youth leader. You don't have to go to the Sunday school teacher. All right. This can all be done simply between you and God. Okay? Now, if you run into difficult times and you have a hard time understanding something, by all means, seek help. Okay? But try God first. Always try God first. Okay, so let's move on. Okay, so my life is not where I thought it would be. And I'm not doing what I thought I would be doing. Stop. We need to make sure we're working off God's definition of good and not ours. So... What is the definition of good? 
Well, he gives us the definition in plain English in verse 29 of the 8th chapter of Romans. And I'm just going to take the middle section of it because this is such an easy definition to learn. It says, predestined to be conformed to the image of my son. Conform is the definition of good. Conform to the image of my son. Basically what that means, the highest good for your life would be that you would become more like Jesus. Didn't say become Jesus. You have to mimic Jesus. It says be more like him. All right? I don't want to bust your bubble. All right? All right? But we're never going to be Jesus. But we're going to strive to be like Jesus. So you've got to learn what Jesus' purpose is, why he does the things he does, and who he does it for. It's the promise. All right? This piano is beautiful. It, it, its capability is to play endless music. All right? We want to become like Jesus. We cannot. We can have the talent. We can have the ability. We can have the knowledge. But until we sit down and turn it on with the power plugged in, it's useless. It will not make a sound. It will not serve its purpose. So in everything that you do, make sure it's plugged in and the power is on. You got to have those two things, and you got to have that right off the bat, okay? Because then comes learning and practicing and everything like that. And trust me, unless you're some genius, you cannot sit down at a piano and play right off the bat. Not even chopsticks or whatever they call it. Okay, you just can't. Okay, so, so the good isn't just that life is comfortable or that you get everything that you want or what you think you need. The whole point of this passage in Romans 8th chapter, verse 27, is you don't actually know what you need. We don't know what to pray for like we ought to. If God gave you everything you thought you needed, our life would be a mess. It really would be. Can you imagine if everything that you've ever asked for, let's be realistic, let's be true to ourselves, okay? If God gave you everything that you wanted, how happy would you truly be? I'd be married to a, well, I almost said it. I would be married to a girl that I have no business being with. I would be in a church that I have no business being in. I would have friends that I have no business being friends with. I would have worldly objects that I have no business holding on to. If God gave me everything, I want it. Everything that I thought I should have. Now don't get me wrong. God gives me things that I want. He doesn't give me everything I want. All right? He just doesn't. Perfect example that I can come up with in closing before I bring Sister Deborah up here and then Sister Blue. Um, it's prescription medicine. Okay, last year there was over 200,000, matter of fact, 238,000 
people that overdosed on prescription drugs. Now just think about that. 238,000 people died. Life ended. No more tomorrow, no more next week, no more vacations, no more nothing. It's over. Because they were taking medicine that they thought that was helping or was designed to help a sickness. And because either they took too much, in this case they did, or they didn't take it in the way that they should have, or they were taking things that they shouldn't have, instead of the purpose of that promise, of that medication, it was used wrong, it was used too much, it wasn't used in the way it should have been used, therefore life ended. I'm going to say something and take this with the utmost love that I can show in this. All right. We are using God's prescriptions. We are using God's purposes. We are using God's promises to fulfill our selfish needs, and that's going to lead to your death. You know, somewhere... And, and forgive me because I don't know where it's at. But it, it says if you add or take away from here, not a good ending. So if you take a promise and you add your own to it, or you take away that, not a good ending. So take the scripture at face value and study it. Find out, first of all, what your interpretation of it is, and then make sure you find out what God's interpretation. Not what Jimmy Swagger, Kenneth Copeland, Jensen Franklin, whoever. You know what? It's like Sister Deborah and Sister Jeanette and me looking at the web. I thought I was going to get this. Sister Deborah made it. I got that. Sister Jeanette made it. I got something different. Make sure you get what God's got for you. Don't leave anything on the table or put everything on the table, however you want to look at it. I think both ways it can work. All right? In negotiation, you don't want to leave anything on the table. All right? But in church, you want to lay everything on the table. Okay? So remember this, people. Part one was finding the good and the promises. God's good. Part two is going to be a little different. So you've got to come back next week. All right, because the following week, Sister Jeanette's going to be preaching, and you won't get the ending. I'm really looking for it. Because sometimes Sister Jeanette gets up here and you can just see the burning, the, the anointing on her and how she just wants to just, Brother Robert, I got this. You just sit back or get down there and get your Bible and listen. She won't dare do that. But I can see it. I can feel it. And if the Holy Spirit wants that to happen, not going to hurt my feelings. I'll take the day off. I'll get the food, I'll get the refreshment, I'll get the rejuvenation. 